welcome. Thank you so much. There you go. Good morning, everybody. I'm really, really honored to be here and uh, especially thrilled that the, whoop, that's not the clicker, that's my phone. Especially thrilled that the topic is, is human nature because that's actually what I want to talk to you about. I think. So let's begin with this quote from uh, the very distinguished economist John Maynard Keynes who said, the ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. And so that's what I want to uh, unpack for you. Uh, given that T in TED stands for technology, I assume that most of you are big technology fans. You eagerly embrace each new gadget. My guess is that most of you have four different gadgets attached to your bodies right now. Uh, a smartphone, a tablet, you uh, belong to a social network, you're, tweet, you're, you're itching to tweet them as soon as you get permission to do it. Uh, not everyone in the world is as eager and enthusiastic as you are about uh, new technology, but adjusting to ever advancing technology is a brute fact of modern life. The technology of smartphones, the technology of brain scans, is what you might call thing technology. This is a very... And this is what we tend to think of. When we think about the impact that science has on our lives, we mostly think about things or about processes. This is where science changes our lives. And there's no doubt that that's true, but there's another kind of technology that's produced by science that has just as big an effect on us, maybe even a bigger effect on us than thing technology, but is somewhat harder to notice. And this is what I have come to call idea technology, and this is what Keynes was talking about. In addition to creating things, science creates concepts, ways of understanding the world and our place in it. And these concepts have an enormous influence on how we think and on how we act. If we understand birth defects as acts of God, we pray. If we understand them as acts of chance, we grit our teeth and we roll the dice, hoping for the best. If we understand them as the product of prenatal abuse and neglect, then we take better care of pregnant women. How we understand birth defects, the ideas that uh, uh, inform our understanding of birth defects have enormous impact on what we actually do. A squirrel um, foraging for food in a bleak winter won't be affected by how it understands the lack of food. Human beings, when they're confronted with a lack of food, will be dramatically influenced by how they understand it. One understanding may lead to resignation, and a different understanding may lead to revolution. And so it seems clear that ideas are just as much products of technology as computers. But there is something about idea technology that makes it different from thing technology. The thing about techno technological objects is that we don't have to worry about them unless they work. If they don't work, they just disappear, right? The dumb new smartphone is not on anybody's list of objects of desire for very long. They go away. Idea, the technology that works we have to grapple with, technology that doesn't work just vanishes into the ether. But idea technology can have profound effects on us even when the ideas are false, even when the ideas don't work. And I call idea technology that is based on false ideas ideology. Now, just a second. I know what you're thinking. Well, maybe I don't know what you're thinking. 
I hope I know what you're thinking. What you're thinking is, listen, the great thing about science is that science puts its propositions to empirical test. If you have an idea, you test it. And if the, you, it, the idea fails the test, it also disappears, just like bad smartphones disappear. Why isn't it the case that false ideas just die of natural causes in the same way that bad technology does? Wouldn't it be nice if that were true? Well, what I'm going to suggest to you is that it's not true. False ideas can live a long and troubling life even though they are false. And I'll illustrate this with a couple of examples. Whoop. Let's take the first example. Why do people work? It is a long accepted tenet of economics, buttressed by certain uh, views uh, in psychology, my home discipline, that if you want to get someone to do something, an employee, a student, a government official, or even your own child, if you want to get someone to do something, you have to make it worth his or her while. People work for pay. People work for incentives. People work for rewards. End of story. You can see this view operating in the carrot and stick approach currently driving our efforts to fix the world economy. To prevent a meltdown like we've been experiencing from happening again, you have to replace the dumb incentives that were operating before with smarter incentives. So, does this sound right to you? That people work for pay and only for pay? Of course that's not right. If that were right, we wouldn't be here today. How much money do organizers of TEDx make for this incredibly laborious effort? My understanding is none. So it must be that even though people do have to make a living, people don't work only for pay. And how do we acknowledge that? We say things about people like, he's just in it for the money. He's just in it for the money. This is not a description. This is an evaluation. This is a criticism. People who are just in it for the money are people we don't respect. And yet, there is a piece of idea technology, ideology, since it's false, that says people are just in it for the money. Now, how come we have not only um, been subjected to this ideology, but we have largely embraced it, witnessed the efforts to fix the financial crisis by throwing different kinds of money at different people for different reasons. I think the answer is that as capitalism developed, as industrial capitalism developed, under the sway of what we might call the incentive theory of everything, a mode of industrial production evolved in which all other possible reasons for working were eliminated. If you are doing the same mind-numbing, repetitive, uninvolved task, hour after hour, day after day, and week after week, why on earth would you do it except for the money? And so what grew up starting in the late 17th century was a system of industrial production that had built into it the assumption that the only reason people work is for the money and the character of the work they do doesn't matter. Of course, if this is the kind of work you do, you work for pay. But is that because it's human nature to work only for incentives? Or is it because we've created an environment in which there are simply no other reasons to work except for incentives? What follows from this argument is that just how important incentives actually will be will depend on the nature of the human workplace. And that is something that human beings have substantial amount of control over. So it may or may not be human nature to work for pay, depending entirely on the kinds of workplaces people find themselves in. So that's one example. Let me give you another. Is intelligence fixed? As many of you probably know, there is some evidence and a great deal of belief that individual differences in intelligence are innate and unmodifiable. Some people, probably most of the people in this room, win the genetic lottery, and some people lose it. 
Is this a piece of idea technology, or is this a piece of ideology? Well, consider the work of psychologist Carol Dweck. Carol Dweck discovered that there are some children, she studied seven, eight, nine-year-old children, who have what she calls performance goals. Their aim is to do well on tests. Their aim is to seek and get approval. There are other kids who have what she calls mastery goals. These kids want to encounter things that they can't do and learn from their failures. As Dweck puts it, performance-oriented children want to prove their ability, while mastery-oriented children want to improve their ability. Children with performance goals avoid challenges. Children with mastery goals seek challenges. What this means over time is that children with mastery goals learn more and get smarter than children with performance goals. So where do these different orientations come from? Dweck has shown that children who have performance goals tend to believe that intelligence is a fixed quantity. You can't get smarter. Why seek challenges? Why risk embarrassment if you can't get smarter? Children with mastery goals tend to have uh, what she calls incremental theories of intelligence. That is to say, you can get smarter. And the reason for seeking challenges and risking embarrassment is that the result of these challenges and these embarrassments is that you will be a smarter person afterward than you were before. So is, is intelligence fixed? Well, it depends on what theory of intelligence you have. If you have a theory that in intelligence is fixed, you're going to behave in a way that makes the theory true by not seeking the challenges that will actually make you smarter. Uh, we see something similar to this in a very recent piece of research on uh, supposed sex differences in mathematical ability. This is a hot button issue these days. And there's a very clever experiment that was done just two years ago in which uh, college-age women took uh, a graduate, uh, graduate school entrance exam in three stages. Stage one was math. Stage two was reading comprehension. Stage three was more math. The reading comprehension section either contained a passage that talked about how women were less good at math than men, based on genetic differences. Or it contained a passage that talked about how women were less good at math than men based on their different experiences. Or it contained a passage about something completely irrelevant. And the question was, how did these women do on the second math portion of the test right after they had read this reading comprehension passage? You clear on the design? And here's what they found. If you read a passage that said, that was about, no, wasn't about math and women, or if you read a passage that said women are worse at math than men because of their different experiences, your performance was the same, and it was the same as it had been on the first math test. If, however, you read a passage that said women are less good at math than men for reasons of genetic sex differences, your performance on the second math test was significantly worse. If you read a piece of idea technology that says there are limits to what women can do when it comes to formal systems like mathematics, you then act in a way that makes that piece of idea technology true. Is it idea technology or is it ideology? We know it's ideology because there's this other group of women who read a different passage who seem to do just fine taking the math test. So these are just two examples. Why do people work and how smart are people and how smart can they get that demonstrate, I think, what I have in mind when I say that ideas that are untrue can have a profound impact on reality if people, and even more important than people, the institutions within which they operate believe those ideas to be true. So how does this happen? There's, a, there's an old and, uh, and valuable idea from the social sciences that's called the self-fulfilling prophecy. And it helps explain what I'm talking about. A young girl believes uh, that she's bad at math and she doesn't try. What happens? She's bad at math. 
Or the girl's teacher believes that girls are bad at math, and the teacher doesn't try to teach them. What happens? They're bad at math. So a self-fulfilling feedback loop gets created. A false statement influences behavior in a way that makes the statement true. Now, when feedback loops like this operate at the level of individual people, there is hope that we can identify them as false and get rid of them. Because there will be other people in society who don't share that view, namely, for example, kids who think that intelligence can increase, and they will demonstrate the falsity of the ideas that influence some of the people in society. So we get a chance to correct our mistakes. But if an idea becomes so pervasive that every corner of society is dominated by it, like people work for pay, it's very hard to find phenomena out there in the natural world that show this idea technology to be ideology. When ideology is held universally, it is very, very difficult to show that it's false. Now, in the natural sciences, Science tends to correct its mistakes. That's good news. Not always as rapidly as we would like, but it does. In the social sciences, we have to be very wary because false ideas can be applied in a way that makes them true. And if that happens, we may never get the opportunity to notice that they're false. We don't have to worry that the motion of planets will be affected by our theories that describe and explain the motion of planets. Planets, as far as I know, are completely indifferent to what we think about them. Let us hope. <laughs> Human beings are not indifferent to what we think about them and to how we describe them. And so we need to be very, very careful when we hear someone say, it is just human nature to be or do one thing or another. Let me close with a little fable that is taken from a movie uh, directed by Neil Jordan called The Crying Game. Uh, I think this fable derives from Aesop, although it's not totally clear that that's true. A scorpion wants to get across the river, but the scorpion can't swim. So the scorpion asks a frog, can I hop on your back and you can take me across the river? The frog looks a little suspicious and says, listen, if I give you a ride on my back, you'll sting me. The scorpion says, why would I do that? If I sting you, we'll both drown. So the frog shrugs its shoulders. Do frogs have shoulders? And says, all right, hop on. And the frog takes the scorpion across the river. And midway across the river, the frog feels a shooting pain in its side. Oh. As they both start to sink beneath the waves, the frog says, why did you sting me, Mr. Scorpion? Now we're both going to drown. And the scorpion says, I can't help it. It's my nature. And the question is, is human nature like scorpion nature? Forty years ago, I'm almost done, a very distinguished anthropologist named Clifford Geertz described human beings as unfinished animals. What he meant by that, not, not monkeys with shoes, but unfinished animals. What he meant by that is that unlike the scorpion, it is human nature to have a human nature that is very much the product of the society in which we live. So you should be very suspicious when you hear explanations that appeal to human nature. Chances are that even if it is human nature, it is a human nature that has been created and not a human nature that has been discovered. Thank you very much.